Glad you're joining us today for worship as we continue on with our uh, cozy Christmas series. Uh, my name is Kip Rose and I'm one of the pastors here at Asbury. And I realize everybody knows the Christmas story, the old story, how it goes. We've heard the word so many times year after year that we could probably repeat it in our sleep. So today I want you to do your best to just hear the words with, with fresh ears. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch, who lived north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. It could be that his head wasn't screwed on quite right. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Well, everybody knows the Grinch, that classic grump created by Dr. Seuss. A lot of us first met the Grinch when we were children. And just because we've grown up now, it doesn't mean that we still don't come across the Grinch from time to time, right? He doesn't just show up on the pages of children's storybooks. Uh, it's not just found, the Grinch is not just found in movies. My guess is that you have probably actually met the Grinch in person a uh, time or two. Maybe he lives in your neighborhood. Maybe she is part of our church. Maybe he has been to your home for Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner. John Artberg, who is a Presbyterian pastor and also an author, tells the story of a Grinch he once knew named Hank. Hank was a cranky guy. He didn't smile easily, and when he did, the smile often had a cruel edge to it coming at someone else's expense. He had a knack for discovering islands of bad news in oceans of happiness. He could always find a cloud where others saw a silver lining. Hank rarely affirmed anyone. He operated on the assumption that if you compliment someone, it might lead to a swelled head. And so he worked hard to make sure that everybody stayed humble. In other words, he had a ministry of cranial downsizing. His native tongue, was complaint. He carried judgment and disapproval the way uh, a prisoner carries a ball and chain. And although he went to church his whole life, he was never unshackled. Well, a deacon in the church asked Hank one day, Hank, are you happy? Hank paused to reflect and then replied without smiling, yeah. And uh, the deacon said, well, then why don't you, why don't you tell your face? But as far as anybody knows, Hank never notified his face. Occasionally, things that Hank grumbled about were things that brought great joy uh, to other people. For example, uh, there was a time in the church when it seemed like his primary complaints had to do with the music at the church. It centered around the music. He was saying, it's too loud. It's always too loud. And so he would complain to the staff and he complained to the deacons and he complained to the ushers. Then he started complaining to innocent visitors at the church. Well, so finally they had to take Hank aside and explain, complaining to guests is not appropriate behavior. Why don't you keep your complaints to a small group of your close friends? Well, that seemed to be the end of it, or, or so they thought it was. Uh, a few days later, a few weeks later, uh, the secretary buzzed Pastor Ortberg on the intercom and said, there's an agent from OSHA here to see you, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They want to talk to you. And the guy told the pastor, I'm here to check out a complaint. The pastor was trying to think, uh, well, who on the staff would have called OSHA to complain about something going on at the church? And then the agent began to talk about the decibel levels of airports and, and rock concerts. And Pastor Orbert said, excuse me, are you sure this was somebody from our church staff that called to complain? And, and he explained, no, if, any, if anybody calls with a complaint, whether they work here or not, we're obligated to investigate. Well, all of a sudden the light bulb came on and, and Pastor Ortman realized it was Hank had called OSHA and said, the music at my church is too loud. And so they sent a federal agent to check it out. Now, how is it that a person, a person who regularly is exposed to the good news of Jesus Christ, how is it that a person like that can become so grumpy, so cranky, and so unpleasant? Truthfully, no one's quite sure what the reasons are. It could be that 
his head wasn't screwed on quite right. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that Hank's heart was two sizes too small. How are things with, with your heart? Today, we're gonna to do a we're gonna do a heart check. How are things with your heart? Wherever you look in this world, you're always gonna find individuals whose hearts, for whatever reason, seem to be shrinking rather than expanding. You, you'll find people like that in storybooks, you find people like that in movies, you'll find them in churches, you find them in communities, you might even find them in your family. You'll even find stories of people like that in the Bible. In Jesus' day, for example, many of the religious leaders that we encounter in the, in the stories, you know, they come up against Jesus and they are uh, the exact type of people who would steal Christmas from Whoville. They would send OSHA to the church to get the music uh, turned down. And you don't have to read very far into the New Testament before you run into stories about small-hearted people attacking Jesus because he dared to offer forgiveness and healing and love to all sorts of people. Well, the Christmas story is about love, God's love. Christmas is a message about God's love for us. It is about the very heart of God. Love came down at Christmas. That's the message for today. Love was born in a stable in Bethlehem. A verse that almost everybody knows expresses that Christmas message of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life, John 3, 16. That is the gift of Christmas. God loved, God gave. Well, we are invited to open our hearts to accept that gift that God gave, to accept the gift of eternal life with faith, to believe in Jesus Christ. Today I want us to take a look at 1 John chapter 4 beginning at verse 7. It's not a traditional Christmas text, but it does, a, it does a great job expressing the love of God that's displayed at Christmas. The verses say, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. That's 1 John 4, verses 7 through 12. That verse 9, it reminds us God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. We see God's love in a manger. The manger reminds us that in humility, God bent down to the earth, becoming one of us. Max Lucado put it this way, the God of the universe was born into the poverty of a peasant and spend his first night in the cow's feeding trough. The God of the universe left the glory of heaven and moved into our neighborhood. Moved into our neighborhood, that's how the message translation of the version of the Bible, that's how it translates John chapter one, verse 14. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. The verse goes on to say, we saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. John 1, verse 14. Love moved into our neighborhood. Love moved into our homes. Love moved into our hearts. God loves us. God wants to be with us. That is the story of Christmas. The Bible also makes a clear connection between, God, between God's love for us and our love for others. We read in 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, here it is, we also ought to love 
one another. And notice that. Notice that God's love comes first. God's love always comes first. God's love in creating the world. God's love in promising a Savior. God's love in sending the one and only Son, Jesus, into the world. God's love in Jesus dying on the cross for us. Again, that verse, in this is love, not that we love God, but God loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love is sometimes hard to describe, isn't it? Here is the love of God described for, for uh, God's love for us being described in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 8. And this is speaking about Jesus again. It says, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. If you ever doubt that God loves you, just look, just look at Jesus. Look at Jesus, the child born into the world as a baby at Christmas. Look at Jesus, the man, teaching the people, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Look at Jesus, the Savior, suffering and dying on the cross for our sins, bringing us to God. Look at Jesus, the King, risen from the grave, ascended to heaven, coming back to take us to be with him that we also may be where he is forever. Nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ. The Apostle Paul reminds us of that in Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor are the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans chapter 8 verses 38 and 39. Well, that's God's love. God's love always comes first. But then our love should follow. Again, from 1 John chapter 4, verse 11 reminds us, Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Our love should follow, not as an obligation, but as a natural outpouring and a natural outgrowth of God's love for us. If God loved us so much that God sent Jesus to die for us, how can we not share that love with others? How can we not do that in return? And if God loved others so much that Jesus, God sent Jesus to die for them, well, how can we not love them as well? Love for others is the mark of Christmas. That is the heart of Christmas. And I think sometimes that's why people get tired and weary and stressed from shopping this time of year. People are trying to find just the right gift because they want the gift to say, I love you. I love you. I remember the first Christmas present I ever bought for my mom. It probably wasn't the first Christmas present I ever gave to my mom because we made gifts for mom. You know, we'd make something in school and we'd give it to our parents. But I think this was the first Christmas present I ever bought with my own money. I can't remember how old I was. I was really young and I can't remember where I got the money to buy the gift. It was only, it was only a few dollars. I, I didn't have an allowance, so it wasn't from there, and I certainly didn't have a job. It was probably, maybe it was money I got for my birthday and I just kept some of it for that, or, or maybe I was given money to buy candy or pop and I, I didn't, I squirreled it away. But anyway, we were in the, we were in, the Yankton, uh, in Yankton shopping at the old Fannels store on the corner of Main Street and 3rd, and Fannels was basically a clothing store. It had a jewelry department, it, it had a cafe in the basement with a lunch counter, as kids, we liked the store because it had an elevator we could ride up and down on. And they even had a monkey in a cage on the second floor in the children's department. And it was in this Fannel store, it was prior to Christmas, that I snuck away from the elevator and I snuck away from the monkey and went to the jewelry counter. And there I purchased the first Christmas present that I ever really bought out of my own pocket. And it wasn't much. It, it was just a little, a little Christmas pin. 
It was in the shape of a little white bell, a Christmas bell. And it had green holly and a little red berry design at the, t at the top of the bell. And even though it wasn't a real bell, it was just a pin, there was a little clanger at the bottom and that would move back and forth. And so I went to the counter and I, I picked out this pin and I paid for it and they put it in a little box with the cotton at the bottom of it and put the lid on and I took it home and I secretly wrapped the present when I got home and Christmas came and it was a great surprise to my mom. She was happy and I was happy and you know what? She still has that silly little pin to this day and sometimes she even still wears it. It was just a simple expression of love. Well, I thought about that gift this week because you see, sometimes even a little kid realizes that Christmas isn't about what we get, it's about what we give. And Christmas is about love. Christmas is about our love for one another. Christmas is about our love for Christ. But again, it all starts with God. God's love is always given first. And that's the love we see in the gift of Christ, the gift of Jesus. There are stories told of a museum of childhood in Scotland that's filled with childhood treasures. Teddy bears and puppets and rocking horses and model trains and books and games and doll houses. And there's also cases and cases of dolls. Uh, I asked people on Facebook this week if they had a favorite doll growing up. There were all kinds of responses. Some were on Asbury's page and quite a few more were on my Facebook page. A lot of, a lot of memories. I, I, you, you should check those out. Well, anyway, this museum had cases and cases of dolls. Baby dolls, porcelain dolls, costume dolls, walking, talking dolls, dolls that could turn somersaults, expensive dolls, the dolls of privileged children, Someone wrote about this museum with all these dolls and they, they pointed out a certain doll that they saw there. They wrote, off in one corner in another case, behind its glass pane another doll sits alone. It's an old raggedy doll, much, much the worse for wear, but then it began its life raggedy. That this doll was loved there is no doubt, nor that it was born of love. For all its shabbiness, and it was shabby the day it was made, it had and has a value untold. The sign on the doll reads, Doll belonging to London Slum Child, circa 1905. The doll is unnamed, it's just doll. The child is also unnamed, just slum child. The article goes on, the, the doll's body is made of tattered brown socks stuffed with rags. Its arms are two thin sticks of wood covered in wool. Its hair is a sock. It wears a plain gingham dress and a rough linen apron. For all its simplicity, it was made with painstaking effort. The head is the heel of a man's shoe, only that. A worn down, battered heel with the nail heads visible around the edges. For a face, the doll has small bits of paper pasted on. Paper eyes, paper nose, paper mouth. The mouth does not smile. Some might call it ugly. That would be wrong, very wrong. It is possible the slum child made it for herself, or perhaps it was a gift created by a mother or a father who was poor in possessions and all they could give was love beyond measure. One does not need to have wealth to create something valuable. One needs only reach deep within where value is defined. One needs not have wealth to give a gift. One needs only to have the desire to give from the heart to use whatever poor things are at hand to make of them the best possible gift. In all the Western world, there were no slums bleaker than those of London in 1905, but somewhere in those slums, a sad and sorry doll was born, a 
a doll that can bring tears to your eyes because it was so pitiful and because it is so very, very beautiful. If you can appreciate the story of that raggedy doll, maybe you can appreciate the story of Christmas. A pitiful doll loved into beauty. That's us. We are that doll. Look at us. Who are we? Who are we that God should love us so much? Often our hearts are two sizes too small. We look at ourselves and there's nothing that warrants God's love for us. And yet there it is. It comes as simply a gift. A gift from a loving God. Love came down at Christmas. We celebrate that love today. Love for one another, love for the Christ child, and most of all, the source of that love, God's love for us. The very heart of God. Is your heart ready to be expanded and changed? Is your heart ready to receive the gift, the gift of God's love in Christ, rather than trying to earn it? Are you able to receive it in your heart today? When, when our hearts are full of Christ, we have this amazing power to transform the hard-hearted world around us. The gift of, of God's love. It was a quarter past dawn, all the who's still a bed, all the who's still a snoozing when the Grinch packed up his sled. Packed it up with their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. 3,000 feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode to the tip top to dump it. Poo poo to the who's, he was grinchously humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then all the who's down in Whoville will all cry, boo hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused and the Grinch put a hand to his ear and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presents at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast, and he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. In Christ, may our hearts grow three sizes this Christmas. And may the world full of Grinches around us watch in wonder and turn their hearts as well toward Christ. Love is born at Christmas. Let us pray. Oh God of love, we do thank you for loving us enough to send your son Jesus into our lives and into this world. We pray that your Holy Spirit would break through into our lives in such a way that our hearts would grow three sizes today. Come, Lord Jesus, come. 
Amen.